Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's program, Patients as Consumers, Elevating the Role of Maintenance by Tying Operations to Patient Care, presented by Jude Solutions and hosted by PSQH. My name is Michelle Clark, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Our program will be 60 minutes in length. The first portion of the program is presentation, followed by a question and answer session. Today's program is being recorded. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to review the web conference platform. First, to ensure that you can see all of the content for the event, please maximize your event window. Second, be sure to address your computer volume settings and or PC speakers for optimal sound quality. Third, at the bottom of your console are multiple widgets you can use. To submit a question, click on the Q&A widget. It may be open already and appear on the left side of your screen. You may submit questions at any time during the presentation. However, please note that it is likely that your questions will not be answered until the Q&A portion of the program. Should you experience any technical difficulties during today's program and need assistance, please click on the Help widget, which is a question mark icon and covers common technical issues. We're very pleased to offer you this free educational opportunity by Jude Solutions. And now I would like to introduce today's speakers. First is Martin Buffler, Senior Healthcare Advisor for Jude Solutions. Next is Susan McLaughlin, Chief Operating Officer for MSL Healthcare Partners. And finally is William Morgan, Senior Consultant at MSL Healthcare Partners. Finally, before we get started, note that an on-demand version of this program will be available approximately one day after the completion of the event and can be accessed using the same login link that you use for the live program. Also, a copy of today's presentation is available in the resource list widget, which is located in the lower left area of your screen. And with that, I would now like to pass the program over to our speakers. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Martin Buffler with Dude Solutions. Thank you all for being here. I'm joined uh, by Bill and Sue. Um, today's presentation will be interactive. We'll have three presenters, and so we'll be going back and forth. Uh, Bill and Sue are both industry veterans and bring tremendous wealth and knowledge and experience to today's presentation, and uh, we'll be sharing that with us uh, during the presentation. So on with the show, let's get going. Um, our first topic, our area of discussion, is the evolving mindset. And this is the concept that uh, power has sh uh, shifted from providers and insurers uh, to consumers. And uh, so really, why is that? And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, First of all, it's the access to information. Um, we, re we just have readily available information. And in addition to that, uh, the ability to share that information through social media, through reviews, ratings, uh, comparisons of startup sites. Um, you know, for example, the, uh, the insurance marketplaces um, by state are now sharing uh, a lot of information. So. Um, and then there's the basic concept that we are not um, we are not waiting for the surveys. We are getting and receiving unsolicited uh, uh, feedback from consumers. The next area is uh, retail medicine, and as you know, we're we're seeing more and more pharmacies uh, pop up with actual emergency rooms inside them with doctors, physicians, nurses. You can now go to a, a CVS and actually see a doctor and get a prescription. Um, so there's many more convenient options for patients these days. In addition, there's the concept of the quantified self, if you will. And um, this means that we not only have access to more information, but we're using more technology and more information uh, to really to make our own decisions. Sue? Yes, thank you, Martin. Uh, a couple of things that I would want to point out is there's a lot of generational aspect to the shift that is um, happening in the healthcare marketplace that you described. Uh, first of all, I know that my parents, and I'm sure that many of you could probably make a similar comment, uh, basically took whatever the physician said to them as this was this was the truth and there was absolute confidence put in in that word well nowadays there's so much information out there so much questioning 
uh, many of us, you know, read from some of the WebMD things and try and diagnose ourselves before we get to the healthcare facility, that we come prepared with a lot of questions. If we have a good experience, we're pretty quick to post that in whatever platform that we use online. And likewise, if we have a really bad experience, that often goes online as well. And so people are aware of the experiences of others, and they frankly put quite a bit of weight in those. Bill? Yes. Um, you know, working as a consultant, I get to travel quite a bit. And as an example, outside the industry, when I travel, uh, a thousand things done right are offset by one thing bad. You know, when you get in a, an airplane, you paid $800 to fly somewhere, and you sit there in the back of the seats worn out and the tray's broken down, or you miss a flight because a bathroom door won't latch. It, it casts a bad light on the whole industry. Uh, the same with with hotels, you know, if you pay $200, $250 a night to stay in a hotel and you can't shave in the morning because the sink won't drain or it takes 20 minutes to get warm water in the shower, even though it was a great experience other than that, all you focus on and all you think about is the negative. And I've, I've seen that with hospitals as well, you know, traveling in some areas. I go down in the morning to the desk and, you know, They'll ask, you know, what am I doing there? What am I working on? And I'll tell them I'm doing a project at the hospital. And they'll say, oh, well, geez, you know, I would never go there. If I had an issue, I'd go to the next town. And, and I just, you know, I know they do a lot of things right, but people focus on the one thing that came out bad. And people talk. Yeah, excellent point. So what is the net effect of these changes? Um, obviously a greater focus on patient care, safety, and satisfaction. As Bill and Sue alluded to, that we're all under the microscope and that information is being shared readily. One other key factor is the Affordable Care Act, um, ACA, and this created a reward system focused on the quality of care. So up to 30%, as we know, of Medicare reimbursement decision is now tied to patient satisfaction on the HCAP survey. So anytime we, we start looking at the relationship between patient satisfaction and prof, profitability, um, this is a, 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 a pretty strong motivator for behavioral change as well. Sue? Yes. Uh, the changes that various organizations are making to their physical plant uh, really do have an impact on these patient satisfaction faction scores, they do come with a significant cost. And understanding that that is extremely problematic for, for many healthcare organizations. But like Bill, I've been in many hospitals across the country, and it's really obvious when an organization has chosen not to move forward with the kind of things that do impact patient satisfaction. Not only does it impact patient attitudes, but it seems to affect staff attitudes as well. And so investing in the facility to promote the changes, I think, has the benefit of, of not only increasing the patient satisfaction scores, but also increasing the satisfaction of the staff members. Bill? Yes. Um, one of the things that, that happened several years ago, they, they started looking at the healing environment, and that's been a, a buzzword for years now, but there's a lot of truth to it. The, uh, the finishes, the condition, the light, the noise abatement, all those things have a huge impact on the patient and their ability to recover and, and to get out of the hospital fast. So it's, it's hard, you know, to do this because with those finishes comes additional maintenance and, and work to keep them up, but they're really critical to the healing environment and to make the patients get well fast. Thank you both. Here's a great quote from Kelly Hancock with the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, and given her role as the chief nursing officer, it makes her comments even more compelling. 
clinicians might check off all the important clinical boxes when caring for a patient, but it's often the very small, perhaps nearly imperceptible, non-clinical elements of a hospital stay that most affect whether a patient has a good experience. And there's a lot to be said in this quote, and I think it really kind of debunks the whole perception that clinical staff are the main ones that really impact patient satisfaction and really starts a strong dialogue and down payment on the whole concept that the physical environment and the, and the role that maintenance and facility staff play is very significant. So let's just, uh, let's go with, it's not just a clinical task anymore. And the physical environment plays a critical and major role in patient experience. Uh, the HPOE guide by ASHI, uh, which we're going to refer to a lot in the body of this uh, presentation today, um, is entitled Improving the Patient Experience Through the Healthcare Physical Environment. And this paper breaks down the ways facility professionals, the management team, can provide patient experience into three important categories. So we're going to focus on those in the next couple slides. People, process, and place. When we talk about people, we talk about the culture of caring and really creating an environment, a team approach to patient satisfaction. And so we've seen a lot of activity over the last couple of years in a shift to create patient advisory committees um, and really including all the key folks uh, within the hospital that are delivering care and, and taking care of things in the physical environment. Um, one, uh, one study that really um, helped kind of move along a lot of this thought and change was the ASHI study uh, conducted with facility managers in 2015. Um, and when they asked how important an FM's role currently is in the patient satisfaction, um, they said 4.23, which is significant. When they asked how important the FM's role should be in the patient satisfaction, the mean score went almost to a 5, 4.67. However, on the flip side, only 50% of the FMs surveyed were really involved in this process. So they not only feel that they're critical and important, they want to be involved, but early on, uh, they weren't really involved in that process. So the more that we can get them involved, uh, the more that they can participate, given all the data and all the information that we're seeing tied to uh, the impact that physical environment has to patient satisfaction. This is a very important trend. So, Sue? One of our client hospitals that I've visited uh, a number of times really hit this uh, head on, I think. They have throughout their building in public areas as well as in patient care areas, uh, poster size photos of various staff members, hospital staff members in various roles, identifying their name, their position title, but identifying them as a caregiver, which I think really uh, gets to the, the whole point. Caregivers are not just clinical staff. In this particular organization, one of the photos that was right outside the cafeteria is of the facility manager. And they really do reinforce that all staff, all hospital staff, are providing patient care. Bill? I've seen uh, several things done out in my travels to hospitals that I thought were really, really incredible. One of them was the no pass, and that was that if a facility person was walking through the unit and there was a call or someone needed assistance for direction, that they were to step in and, and play a role not in their silo as a facility manager or a facility staff person, but to work directly with patient care when needed. So they had a no pass program where if there was a call light on in an area that the staff in that area would all have the responsibility of responding to see what they could do to help that patient. Excellent. Thank you both. So another example um, when it relates to people and creating a culture of caring, um, 
a study and a project actually done by St. Barnabas Hospital in New York City where they actually uh, trained and worked with the frontline non-clinical staff to take extra steps when uh, working in a patient's room. And some of the things that they did and implemented were um, when, the, uh, when the folks walked into the room to actually introduce themselves um, and tell them why they were there, how long that would actually take, um, and in the process, ask the patient uh, their name and how they were feeling, um, and then if they were comfortable, if everything that they needed, um, you know, in terms of uh, room temperature, you know, food, et cetera. And then when they completed the task, they were, um, you know, they told them they were actually done and asked them if there was anything else they could do and then made eye contact. And so just this shift in behavior in terms of interacting and acknowledging the patient was, was pretty dramatic in terms of um, seeing a rise in, in patient scores and, 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 and feedback to the hospital. Sue, Bill? Yeah, I, I have had some really great experience with this on, on hospital visits where they've actually taken the staff through some training. You know, the, the maintenance staff that you typically get in a hospital have varying levels of ability to communicate. And to sit them down and do a 20-minute discussion with them on how to introduce themselves, you know, and describe those same things that you just talked about on why they're there, what they want to do, are there other issues that they could help them with, I think would go a long way to relax both the maintenance and get better response from patients in the room. And it's it's something that we had talked about doing at my last hospital but never seemed to get around to. And I, I could see now that that would be very valuable for patient scores. Thank you, Bill. So now we're going to move on to process. And um, process as it relates to supporting both patients and staff and really making sure and asking the right questions, do your processes allow you to quickly respond uh, to your stakeholders' requests? Are you making it easy as possible for them to do their job? And um, so making sure that we are communicating real time to the, the critical people, the critical caregivers, our stakeholders, the nurses, and doing the things like making sure the halls are clear of obstructions is the equipment functioning properly and readily available? Are the supplies laid out efficiently? Um, and really trying to ensure that is the clinical staff happy, therefore their ability to deliver timely uh, patient care um, is job number one. And so this is a very important concept to really take a look at all the processes that you have in, in place and really serving the stakeholders uh, in your facility so they can really focus on the, on, on the patients. When, uh, the next area we're going to talk about is the place. And so we've talked about people, processes, and now place. And the place, the actual physical environment, plays a critical role as well. Um, and and uh, we look at key areas within the physical environment that can play an active role in enhancing and helping deliver quality care. Noise is a big one, uh, well-kept equipment. Um, making sure that you've got sound absorbing materials and carpeting. Uh, lighting is another key item. Um, making sure that it's correct and that it's, uh, comfortable for the patient. Uh, temperature, again, is always a key one, not just for HVAC compliance, but temperature regulation uh, for, the payment, uh, for the patient as, as well as the staff. Sue? I'm sorry. Yes, I have a couple of things uh, to add from personal experience. Um, when I was in the hospital as a patient a number of years back, um, I really was focused on the noise issue based on one particular event, and that was there was a, a – news event uh, that was very well known, national and even global, and when it happened in the middle of the night, 
there was a staff member in the hospital that essentially ran up and down the hall so excited because of what happened. And, you know, while I get the emotion, it was very distracting to myself and I'm sure every other patient on the floor that evening. So uh, it's, it really is important to pay attention to our actions. And as, as hospital uh, providers and, and think about how that actually does impact the patient. The other thing that I want to mention is one thing that makes the noise at night problematic, and that is the fact that we have to do fire drills, one drill per shift per quarter, including on the night shift. Now, there is language in the NFPA code that allows us to silence the audible alarms at night, but both the strobe lights and the fire doors need to function. So if you cannot, in your own organization, separate the audible alarms from the visual and from the doors, you are required to ring those alarms at night. Now, one of the things in the newer NFPA codes is that they permit uh, constructing new uh, air, or critical areas, rather, with no audible alarms and only strobe notification. And I think that's a real step forward. So that's the kind of thing that we have to be looking at as well, and it does um, make a difference. I mean, I'm sure that the patients, when we do have to have these fire drills at night, are probably quite disturbed. Thank you, Sue. So just, just as this slide and the last slide both really highlight all aspects of the physical environment where the patient experience takes place, and again, these are items that are directly affected or controlled and maintained by the facilities uh, staff. So including that, our equipment, uh, making sure that all of the equipment in the room is functioning, call button, TV, um, we've also taken a risk mitigation approach. We've checked the equipment in the room, for example, the handrails on the bed, flooring. Uh, we've cleared the hallways and made sure there's no extra equipment in the room. Um, and then there's also the issue or the, the concept of remodels and renovations. And some of the simple fundamental things we can do from moving from a double, triple patient room to a single, uh, the layout of the room, the layout of the building, the access to uh, the restroom and facilities, um, the addition of new windows, decorations. So these are all things that the facilities team, operations team can do to really affect uh, the physical environment and the patient experience. Sue? Yes, uh, again, some personal experiences that I have had because when we are out uh, evaluating the environment uh, for one of our hospitals that we visit, we don't always get to spend much time in the patient's room. Uh, but I have looked at two different uh, updated patient rooms from a family member's perspective when I was in uh, doing some visiting. Now, one, these are two different facilities. One hospital had a system that when a staff member entered the patient room, their photo and job title would appear on the TV screen, which was really a, a beautiful way of introducing whoever was in the room and what you know, essentially by job title, what they were there for. And yet in another facility, I was totally impressed by the design and the technology and the appearance of the hospital to the point that I thought, hmm, this is a little bit far for me to go, but perhaps it would be something that I would like to consider in the future is using that facility. So again, some of this is just visual, some of it is technology, but it does make a difference.
So now we're going to shift to the discussion about the HCAP survey. Um, this is a great uh, quote uh, pulled from the HPOE guide that we referred to earlier in the presentation. The HCAP survey focuses mostly on the patient's experience of care, while only two of the survey's 32 questions are specifically focused on the physical environment Every aspect of the patient's experience of care is influenced by valuable and often underused resources, the healthcare physical environment and the people who manage it. So when we talk about very specific questions on the survey, there's really only two questions that really hone in on the hospital environment. One, how was your hospital stay? How was the actual physical environment, the room? And the second, um, interestingly enough, has to do with noise. And as Sue um, talked about, how critical this is and how important it is. And so given that there's only two questions related to the physical environment, a lot of the practices that we're talking about today can really go a long way to ensure that uh, we're getting positive results uh, in this area. Secondly, when it comes to people and processes, um, as you can see, so several of the things that we've talked about in terms of making sure that we are um, proactively managing the physical environment and really addressing these things before they happen, uh, again, can go a long way to how we, um, the feedback that we see in certain areas of the survey, especially um, from a caregiver uh, standpoint uh, to the nurses, and the nurses being one of the significant stakeholders of the facility management team, which starts to tie together and how important those customers are. All right, next we're going to transition into maintenance. And obviously, day-to-day -day maintenance plays a critical role in terms of our ability to control the physical environment and create a patient-safe uh, uh, environment as well. And so we've got a couple examples that we're going to walk through, and then uh, Bill and Sue are going to share some as well. But um, when you look at infection control, obviously this is very critical, um, and making sure that the equipment that was being used is being maintained properly and cleaned on a regular basis. Here was an example in, uh, in New Orleans uh, a couple years ago where uh, 12 patients contracted a rare surgical site infection uh, simply because of a piece of equipment that wasn't properly uh, being maintained and cleaned. Sue? Yes. Uh, one hospital uh, that we worked with had noticed that one of their OR suites had a higher infection rate than the others. And in looking into this problem, uh, it was discovered that uh, there had been some compromises made in the places in the placement of some of the air handling equipment within the room. And that was part of the investigation, although that was not directly tied to the cause. In another case, though, poor seals around patient room windows resulted in uh, entry of some dust from the construction that was going on outside of the, the building. And that one actually resulted in a patient death. So these things really do make a difference. There's also a concern, and, and this is scored pretty regularly during surveys, for infection prevention problems that are associated with things like torn upholstery and wooden patient furnishings, none of which can be cleaned really well, and, and that can lead to problems as well. So this is all physical environment stuff that bottom line impacts the, can impact the patient clinically. Bill, any comments? Yeah, I can tell you that, you know, from being a past Joint Commission surveyor, there's been a huge emphasis lately from Joint Commission on infection control and just what Sue talked about. When the surveyor goes through the patient environment, both in the room and surgery and those other areas where they receive, receive treatment, they look at the condition of the space for cleanability. If, if I go in an OR and there's cracks in the floors, holes in the walls, damaged equipment, um, damaged arm boards that aren't repaired, foam, 
Velcro, you know, tape everywhere. They will write it up as an infection control. So that that's one area I've seen where we could really use a lot of improvement when I go through hospitals. So another example, another area um, tied to maintenance tasks and the patient that's very, um, very important and, and talked about quite often is uh, slip fall, the whole route, uh, reducing the patient risk. Um, but this also applies to, to hospital stakeholders as well. But Memorial Hermann uh, in Texas Medical Center in Houston, um, they created an inter intervention plan to help reduce falls and increase uh, patient safety in three units of their hospital. Um, this included uh, adequate lighting in the rooms and bathrooms, night lights for high-risk patients, uh, fluorescent floor tape to identify the path to the bathroom, uh, low boy beds for high-risk patients, um, and bed exit alarms. And what they saw over a two-year period of time was uh, fall rates decreased uh, by 8%. Um, and then reduce falls from 47 uh, with a cost of 28,000 in 2005 to uh, 25 with uh, an associated cost of 15 in 2007. So both very dramatic shifts in terms of cost savings, but more importantly um, from a safety perspective. Sue, do you have a comment? Yes. Uh, I think this raises a, a very important point for uh, healthcare because when we look at this example that you discussed, uh, this organization was making changes to the physical environment to help reduce patient falls. And what I see out there is often hospitals don't report patient fall data to the Environment of Care Committee. And I really do believe that there, that is a practice that needs to be changed because there can be environmental factors uh, such as the absence of lifting equipment or inaccessibility of that equipment, uh, delays in patient response or in response to the patient is really what I'm trying to say, such as what Bill discussed earlier with the no-pass zones. And it can even relate to something as simple as the floor polish. But what I've seen happen all too often is patient falls are looked at as a clinical issue. And so the, the uh, frequency of the falls and the causes of the falls are never really discussed at the environment perspective. And I think that's a mistake. Yeah, I would agree. That's critical information. Um, another quick little antidote, I was at the IFMA show this week in Houston and ran into a CEO that I've done some work with, and he was standing at a flooring booth, and uh, we chatted for a minute, and the conversation really evolved to, he was he was purchasing a half a million dollar flooring order because the surgeons at his hospital basically said, if you don't change the flooring, you know, we're we're not going to work. And so it, it is a tremendous uh, piece in terms of um, not only from a patient standpoint, but from a stakeholder standpoint, very important piece in the hospital. All right, next slide is really, again, more about maintenance tasks in the patient. And um, here's another example um, with some profound uh, data impact and uh, some real shifts in, in responses. Um, and this really relates to um, uh, a renovation that actually took place at South Shore Hospital in Massachusetts. And um, they were adding a new wing. And when they did this, they made improvements to the old wing by adding nurse stations that were actually closer to the patients. So they had more single rooms um, with layouts specifically designed to facilitate interaction with the patient. So when the staff actually entered the room, it actually created a dynamic where they were having interaction. They added couches to create fold-out beds, um, much better lighting, windows, and what they saw in the results was pretty dramatic. Um, patients were actually discharged a day earlier. Um, we saw uh, data on age cap that um, showed responsiveness jumped from 52 to 89. 
uh, communication with the nurses, uh, 68 to 97. And then the recommended score went from 64 to 87. And you can see the translations in some of that data um, uh, and how important it is um, on the HCAP survey. So the next area we're going to talk about, um, and again, kind of going back to Sue's point, how important uh, noise reduction is um, and what a critical role that maintenance can play in helping reduce noise. Um, Enlo Medical Center in Chico, California made um, major facility improvements to their new tower with the focus of reducing noise level. The layout of the patient rooms were inset off the hallway. Layout of the patient rooms were designed to actually reduce congestion around nurse stations. Uh, the choice of flooring um, to help reduce the, the noise. Um, and then there were a lot of low-hanging fruit changes, lubrication of the wheels, uh, stop floor buffing during hours, um, routing with the staff pages to cell phones. So a lot of day-to-day -day activity, and, and Sue alluded to several of those things uh, earlier, and how individually they might not seem that important, but collectively, if you put all that together, it can, it can be a dramatic, it can have a dramatic impact to the facility and they saw um, a significant impact uh, at their facility. Bill, I know you've got some insight here, too. You bet. <clears throat> noise is a big thing. If you've ever spent time in a hospital, you'll, you'll know why. Um, one of the hospitals that, that we did some work with had a unique idea. They had uh, looked like a traffic light at the nurse stations, and they were central to the patient care area. And they were set up with a decibel meter, so if it was green, then the noise level was correct. And if it was yellow, it was getting a little noisy. And then if it was red, there was there was a noise issue. And it was to make people aware of when you're in the hallways to, you know, keep your discussions down, keep the noise down, quit, uh, quit making a lot of noise around patient areas. That's something I have to make myself aware of when I'm out doing a mock survey when you're walking the floors doing a building tour and you're discussing with a group of three or four people a finding or something that you see in an area, to make sure you stay away from patient rooms so that you don't interrupt the patient's stay. Uh, one of the gentlemen we worked with, you know, going to the noisy wheels, one of the first things he did when he became a facility director was all of the equipment that would be used on the floors, he had all the wheels replaced from the hard plastic wheels to a, a better quality wheel with bearings in it and a rubber tire on it to reduce the noise of cart traffic up and down the hall. I don't know if you've heard of flatbed with a load of product going to the supply room, but it'll wake you up at night if they bring it down the hallway. Yes, that's quite a noisy event. So the next area we're going to talk about is really taking reporting and that sharing of data uh, a step further. So anything to do with preventive, predictive, and corrective maintenance reporting can have a very significant impact. So really trying to identify trends in corrective work to solve problems before they occur, so we're not actually reacting uh, to events and to, to repairs and to interruptions, but we're actually uh, taking care of things ahead of time. Um, use uh, to schedule PM tasks and reduce the amount of corrective work. Um, so lower the amount of corrective tasks um, has a direct correlation to greater patient satisfaction. So again, anything that we can do proactively um, and start looking at and measuring, monitoring what is important. Um, because as we know, anything we can do um, ahead of the game proactively to ensure that patient care is being delivered um, and that work orders are being responded to in a timely manner can have a dramatic impact on our stakeholders as, as well as our patients. Bill? We did a, a program similar to what you're talking about at one of the hospitals I worked at, and we had really great results. We used our building automation, or not building automation, our bu building computer maintenance management software to set up a PM that moves away from corrective maintenance to proactive. So we took all of our patient rooms and all of our patient areas, the exam rooms, treatment rooms, and surgery, all of those areas, and we put them into a room PM program to where each room would be completely serviced at least once a year. 
and the goal was to go like in a patient room to go in to that room and change the lights, change, clean the P-trap, caulk the sinks, paint, patch, buff the floors, make sure the TV's operating properly, UPM on the bed, make sure everything in there works just like new so when patients are in there, they don't have to call because something isn't working. So it, it reduced our corrected calls to the floors, but it also took a lot of the work away from the staff on the floor for calling in and maintenance for PM or for repair work because it was picked up during the PM. It was really a, a good tool and it worked well for us. That's fantastic. So continuing with that same theme of the reporting and really using that data, um, really tracking the average work order time for open and completion and really understand how fast your team is resolving work orders um, and open items. Are you solving issues quickly for patients and staff? Um, and if the reports show that you are closing work orders uh, faster, connect this data, use this data to really support your commitment and your impact to um, providing higher staff and patient satisfaction. Um, comparable to less time in waiting room for patients is, is a great outcome too. Bill? We had a, a system at my last hospital where we had what they called zone maintenance. Rather than a person just going to an area when they were called to go there, they had a specific area they were responsible for. And part of our evaluation system of that, we used real events to help track that rather than having me just make a judgment on someone, we use real data. And we use those calls, the turnaround time on calls, as well as uh, we used an inspection process key to our computer maintenance program where we would go in those space areas that they had a responsibility for and do an evaluation of the condition. And then they were scored on that, and that was part of their process for pay for performance increases at the end of each year. Uh, a couple of our goals was to make them more responsible for their areas and look for things to, to repair and maintain versus making the staff working in the area take time away from their duties to write work orders and call in for corrective action. And it, it seemed to be good in two ways that reduced those calls, but it also made the staff more accountable and they had more ability to impact their pay raises. That's great. Sue, I know you have some insight on this as well. Yes. Um, I think that this is a very, very important case for performance monitoring in the environment of care. And, and performance monitoring goes beyond your making sure that you are compliant with all the regulations. It really looks at areas where you do have opportunities for improvement, such as the turnaround times we've been discussing here. Uh, you need to be looking at data on this kind of thing that represents uh, how you are doing when it, when it uh, applies to meeting the patient needs, meeting the staff needs, and keeping the environment functional and up to date. So I think all of this is, is food for thought and food for potential performance monitoring that should be reported to and discussed in your environment of care uh, committee. Excellent point and a great tie-in, Sue. Thank you. Um, another area tied to reporting is really the, the concept of variance or exception-based reporting and uh, really making sure that we really understand um, what we're getting done, but also what we're not getting done, and making sure that that has been identified, there's a plan to get that done, and uh, really dialing that in so that we stay on top of it. And so an example of this would be untimely medical assessment or treatment, and if we, the, the team, did not have the equipment that they needed or it was broken, so what facility roadblocks might have contributed uh, to that breakdown and really using scenarios like that to really test and examine that we have the right processes in place. And as Sue um, you know, mentioned, that we're going above and beyond the regular maintenance, but we're really looking at ways to ensure that those things are getting done and, and processes are in place. 
Another area that we want to mention, uh, very important, tied to reporting, is the whole concept of refurbishments and renovations. And we saw some of the studies earlier in the presentation really highlighted the impact of, of actually going the extra yard and replacing equipment and making, making the upgrades. Um, and um, we saw a, uh, uh, the team found a great program that was implemented by uh, New York Prez called the FACE program. And they took a very aggressive uh, approach at identifying that the changes to the physical environment and upgrading the facilities and doing significant renovations had a very strong correlation a positive correlation tied to the patient experience as well as the employee engagement. So it really hit home on two levels. One, the employees were excited about this and their attitude and their behavior changed, but overall the patient experience was very, very significant. So using capital planning, forecasting, predictive maintenance models to really hone in on uh, items and areas within the facility that need to be upgraded, need to be refurbished and replaced um, ahead of the time that they're actually going to break down. This is a, uh, a quick quote kind of taken from uh, the FAC program, and I think it really uh, kind of sums up the importance of really taking or considering taking a very aggressive uh, look at the idea of really refurbishing and making an investment ahead of time. And so with Medicare reimbursements increasingly tied to patient satisfaction, the appearance of a facility is a bottom line issue more now than ever. No matter how much a hospital staff cleans a room with dingy finishes and old paint, it will not feel clean to many patients. Refurbishing spaces can improve patients' experience and therefore have a dramatic impact on HCAP scores. The program improves the patient and family experience by providing a cleaner, up-to-date, code-compliant, and aesthetically pleasing environment during their stay at the hospital. So I encourage you guys to take a look at that, uh, that paper and that, uh, that article as well. So one last thing tied to reporting is uh, real-time monitoring of the heating and cooling. And this, over and above the obvious HVAC tasks associated with you know, regular maintenance and, and compliance, but also looking at it from a patient satisfaction and comfort standpoint, really making sure that we understand how temperature plays such a significant role in the physical environment. Um, and looking in particular at surveys and feedback. Did patients have to request an adjusted uh, temperature, an adjustment to temperature over multiple times? Um, were the vents in the room functioning properly? So did we do everything ahead of schedule to really make sure that the air quality and air condition, the temperature and heating in that room is, is ready for that patient? Um, one of the things that, that comes up in several of these uh, um, documents, especially the HPO guide, is having a pre-room survey, a checklist. Um, and this really goes a long way uh, to helping ensure that that room is in good shape um, prior to the patient arriving. So some of the things that can be included in that are patient controls, making sure the nurse call buttons are working. Is it clean? Is it patient ready? Is the TV working? Lighting, room controls, temperature. Um, is the bathroom clean, water working? Uh, patient board ready and updated? Is there a possible welcome packet with instructions? So, Bill, I know you've got some insight on this as well. Yeah, one of the things that, that I know as a patient and as a, a surveyor is people like to have some control over their environment. So when you bring a patient into a patient room, if they don't want to call a nurse to turn on a light or to open a drape or adjust the heat or change a channel on the TV, so the more that you can automate into the, into the bed to where that patient has control of the environment, it reduces calls, nuisance calls to your staff, and it also gives them a sense of control, which really goes a long way to satisfaction. So if they can adjust the TV, the curtains, the lighting directly from the bed, and that's not something that's hard to do, if you can get that set up, you'll have far better outcomes. Sue, I know you have some insight as well. Thank you. 
Yeah, so this is really picking up on what, what uh, Bill said, is I've seen the newer systems that have the lighting controls, the temperature controls, the blind controls, all into the same device that's the nurse call at the side of the bed. And it really does make put the patient in control of the environment and makes a, a really big difference. Excellent. We're getting a little short on time, so I'm going to move quickly to uh, the Q&A here. But again, I would encourage everyone to uh, download and access the HPO guide. It's a tremendous resource for everything that we've talked about today with some very specific examples about putting together teams, hospital leader checklists, and uh, really um, you know, using a lot of really good information there. Here's a great quote. Again, I'm not going to read this, but uh, just to keep things moving along, uh, this is a tremendous resource for everybody. Um, quick overview on the Works Hub, um, Dude Solutions. We're very excited about our commitment to the healthcare market. And uh, here at Dude Solutions, we have created uh, the Works Hub, which is a full suite of operations management solutions for healthcare. Uh, we help facility management teams manage the physical environment tied to maintenance surveys, um, PO and inventory management, capital planning, and then we also have a, a tool called Works IQ to help with intelligence and KPIs. So some very specific things tied to creating mock, survey, mock surveys, uh, digitizing paper surveys, a lot of the things Sue kind of made reference to in and around and supporting the EOC and managing the physical environment. So um, we have a quick poll Actually, I'm, going to, I'm supposed to turn it over. I'm going to turn that back over. I apologize um, to the Q&A section here. And um, thank you all. And uh, we'll get ready for Q&A. Just encourage, if you haven't made, uh, if you haven't submitted any questions, uh, to please go ahead and um, you can submit those now. And uh, Bill and Sue will be on the phone here for another 10 or so minutes uh, to answer questions. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, this brings us to the Q&A portion of the program. So we'd now like to invite you to ask live questions of our speakers. To submit a question, click on the Q&A widget at the bottom of your screen. It may be open already and appear on the left side of your screen. And please note that your questions will remain anonymous and will not be viewable by other audience members. Uh, our first question is, how do you suggest getting buy-in from the my maintenance team on a change as big as making them talk to patients or implementing no path zones. These might be seen as things that aren't a part of their job description. I will open that to any of the speakers. Okay, uh, I, I'll start with this one. Uh, I think that maintenance people, everybody in the organization, not restricting it just to maintenance, but has to realize that the world in healthcare is, is changing and that we really do, we are all caregivers. And I think that that's, that's the whole point. And if we really have limited our job descriptions to that fact that they're, they're just here to do maintenance or whatever else their job may be, that that really does them as well as the organization a disservice. I think we have to perhaps improve the way, one, that we write our job descriptions to include the caregiving at, uh, aspect, and, and secondly, like Bill mentioned earlier, work with training them uh, to recognize that they are part of the caregiving team. I agree, Sue. I, I think having that training and expectation and then having it as part of the job description is the best way to go. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, what's the best way to start communicating data like this to the executives that I report to? I, this, this bill, I think the first start is to get this information and data watched and reported to the Environment and Care Committee. That committee should be working directly with senior leadership 
So those rounding tools that are part of environment and care and those other committees that he would set up that are totally focused on this healing environment, those should go directly to environment and care and to the leadership group through environment and care as one source. There may be others as well. And Sue, do you have anything to add? Yes. Uh, I think that in addition to all of that, we have to be able to understand really this whole concept of patient satisfaction as it relates to the reimbursement of the hospitals. Uh, anything that can be put in financial terms to present to senior leadership with, um, you know, a cost and a benefit to each of these these um, actions that we may want to take will really uh, put the whole issue in their language. Uh, look at the, the return on investment based on the reimbursement factors and so forth. That's great, thank you. And, and it looks like we have time for one more question, and it's how do you suggest taking a pulse on whether patients are satisfied? Um, and I guess it's a two-part question. And do you have any suggestions for implementing mock surveys or gathering this information from them? Well, uh, I assume that in, in all hospitals at this point that there is a follow-up patient satisfaction score uh, survey taken based on, on the things that we've talked about today because it definitely does uh, relate to the reimbursement and the hospitals are required to collect that data. So that's one thing. But I think also um, not necessarily collecting additional data on patient satisfaction, but doing your environmental tours and going out and seeing what is working, what is not working, and where changes need to be made in the physical environment is, is very important. That's the way you know what's really happening with your staff out there, is to be walking around the building and, and doing the environmental tours. Um, I think it's unfortunate that the elements of performance have been removed by uh, from the Joint Commission standards, but I still advocate that it's, it's something that you actually absolutely have to do in order to assess um, your performance and the performance of your staff. Great. Thank Sue, you. one Thank of the things, if, I'm sorry, yes, I, no. I agree with Sue, and one of the things that I would recommend with the environment of care rounding is not to be so totally focused on just compliance, you know, not just looking at the fire extinguishers, you're not blocked in those typical things, but to look at the condition of the space and, and ask that question, can it be clean, is it pleasing, Is it? does it look right, you know, as you go through those spaces especially in the OR area. I've had several hospitals really struggle with that because you have to suit up and, and schedule to get down in there, and they just don't get to it. So it's kind of like a submarine that never it's out of sight and out of mind. So you have to make a concerted effort to get into those spaces and look at the condition of the space. Great. Thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, we have run out of time for questions. In closing, we want you to know that your feedback is very important to us. As seen on screen at the bottom of the current slide is a link to the evaluation. A live, clickable link can be found in the resource list as well as in program evaluation widget at the bottom of your screen and it will also appear in the slide window at the conclusion of the program. We would greatly appreciate your thoughts on our program today. I'd like to thank our speakers again for joining us and sharing their knowledge on this topic. And to our listeners, thank you all for putting aside so much valuable time to watch our program. We hope you found it informative, and we look forward to providing you with other helpful programs in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our program. Thank you again for joining us, and have a wonderful day.